Hello YouTube! Today I'm going to show you how I made this automated air filter that turns itself on automatically and turns itself off automatically depending on the particulate level in the air. Keep watching for more. The first thing I did in this project was measure the dimensions of this high velocity fan. After I knew the dimensions of the fan, I brought in a piece of plywood from the room next door and cut out a square that will be the front for the fan. This required the use of my handy dandy circle cutting jig that I made in a previous video. If you want to watch that video, I'll drop a link in the description. I really like that the circle cutting jig doesn't require a through hole and also uses a plunge router. Look at how proud I am of myself. The next step was to get to building a frame for the high velocity fan so that I had a place to insert a filter behind the fan. I'm only going to use a 1 inch filter on this project because I had a number of them laying around and space is at a premium in my basement shop. If I had more space I'd use a thicker filter or make a box or triangle out of the filters to increase the surface area of the filter material. The larger amount of surface area will result in less restriction in airflow and to filter the most amount of particulate out of the air we want the highest amount of cubic feet per minute or CFM of possible air to flow through the filter. What filter should we use on this project? That's a bit of question of trade-off. Standard HVAC filters use the MERV rating system or minimum efficiency reporting values. The MERV number gives us a little clue as to how efficient the filters are at filtering out different sizes of particles. The higher the MERV number, the better the filter is at filtering out smaller particles. So basically just think of it like it's a bullshit filter. The higher the number, the more bullshit you filter out. Basically like when Crazy Aunt Marjorie brings up JFK or other politics during Thanksgiving dinner. Particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers are known as fine particles, or PM 2.5. These types of particles pose the greatest risk to your health as a respiratory system cannot adequately expel them if they are inhaled. This can lead to a number of cardiorespiratory diseases, permanent lung damage, and extreme long-term exposure cases, even death. If that doesn't scare you, it should. If we choose a filter with an extremely high MERV number, it will also be more restrictive. This means that the fan will flow fewer cubic feet per minute through the filter. So what we want is a filter that will flow well, but still filter out particles that are 2.5 micrometers in diameter. Therefore, the minimum MERV rating I'd choose to use on a DIY shop filter is a MERV 11. This is the lowest MERV number that is rated to filter out particles in the 2.5 micrometer range. At this point in the video, you might have noticed that I moved the fan further back in the box. This was because when I originally mounted the fan, there was too much space between the blades and the circle I cut at the beginning of the video. This caused a decent bit of backflow. And no, not the type of backflow you get after trying to chug a 2 liter of Sprite. To remedy this vomiting, uh, backflow issue, I cut out a new fan shroud out of MDF, or medium density fiberboard. I had quite a bit of this laying around due to me building some shaker style cabinet doors for my kitchen. I have a video of building some of these shaker style cabinet doors out of MDF I'll drop a link to in the description. But to make this a useful fan shroud I needed to cut another circle. I found the middle of this piece of MDF by marking corner to corner and then put some scraps down so that I wouldn't cut through the top of my table saw. The nice thing about using the plunging router for this circle jig is that I can control the depth of the cut. You can see I have the depth set too low initially, so I turn this little dial that controls the depth of the cut by creating a stop. There are three settings on this dial, each quarter inch deeper than the previous. The depths of the stops are changeable, so they don't have to be a quarter inch if you don't want them to be. After I finished cutting the circle out, I got out the vacuum. This is kind of like power washing, so I'll just let you enjoy this without listening to my annoying voice. After I was finished vacuuming, I glued the new MDF fan shroud on. The new shroud is a couple inches in diameter smaller than the one I cut at the beginning of the video. I used some glue and the diagonal lines I drew to mark the center of the circle as markers so the screws would be symmetrical. I used this backer rod as a seal between the edge of the fan and the new MDF fan shroud. 
This should help cut down on vibrational noise and create a bit of a seal to prevent backflow. The only remaining thing left for me to do before this fan would function as a shop filter is to create a place for the filter to sit. This could be done with tape or velcro or pretty much any number of adhesives, but I had a bunch of wood, so I built it out of wood. Up until this point, this DIY air filter is like every other DIY air filter on the internet. The problem with this setup is how do you know the air is clean? How do you know you need to turn the filter on? How do you know when it's okay to turn it off? This is where this filter differs from the rest. When the PM 2.5 levels exceed 12 micrograms per meter cubed, the filter will turn itself on and continue to run until the levels are back under 12. Keep watching, I'll explain. But first, I need to create a housing for the electronics. I deliberately chose watertight housings for the electronics so that they would keep dust out. Now, being watertight doesn't necessarily mean that it's also dust tight, but if it won't get water in it, it probably also won't get dust. I used my automated battery powered DIY drill press vise to hold these junction boxes while I drilled some mounting holes into them for the liquid tight connectors and drilled a few more holes to mount a solid state relay. The solid state relay will allow a low voltage DC microcontroller to control the line voltage needed by the fan. This solid state relay requires two holes to be drilled for mounting. I chose a metallic box to mount the solid state relay in as the box will act as a heat sink for the relay. Reading the data sheet for this relay reveals that a heat sink isn't necessarily needed for this application since the fan does not draw enough current. However, it's always good practice to apply a little thermal compound to the back of the relay when mounting to prolong its life. And if you've been wondering what I'm doing here in this box, I'll show you a schematic. This very crudely drawn in Photoshop schematic shows how this system is wired up. First, I grounded the box in the receptacle. The ground wire is the green one. Next, I ran the neutral or white line to the nickel colored screws. Finally, I'll break off the tabs connecting the upper and lower outlets on this receptacle and then power them separately. The upper terminal will be powered continuously and the lower will be controlled by the relay. If that's confusing to you, please review some videos on how to wire receptacles. If you need help, please ask before trying anything. As Ready Kilowatt likes to say, remember kids, Electricity can and will kill you. If you want me to do some videos on how to wire up receptacles, feel free to drop a comment below. Here you can see me cutting the tab connecting the upper and lower outlet on this receptacle. This way they can be powered independently. I make sure to break off the remaining pieces of the tab after I've cut it. Also, please take note that depending on where you're watching this from, the colors of your wires may differ from what's shown here. I'm in the States and generally white is our neutral, black is line, and green is ground. You can see me connecting the neutral wire in this shot and then screwing in the screw so that it's not protruding out of the side of the receptacle. You also notice a solid tab connecting the upper and lower outlets. And here I am connecting the grounding wire to the receptacle. I already connected the grounding wire to the metallic box earlier in this video. In the event of a short, the grounding wire provides a low path resistance to ground. Due to Ohm's law, this will cause a rapid increase in amperage and cause your breaker to trip. To finish the wiring in the box, I screwed the black hot wire to the upper outlet. This one will always be live. The bottom will be switched by the relay. If you're planning on building one of these, make sure to separate your low voltage controls and your high voltage power into separate boxes. Not only is it electrical code, it's also important from a life safety aspect. While we're on this topic, when we are finished building this and ready to test it out, it would be a very wise idea to plug this into a ground fault circuit interrupter or GFCI receptacle the first time in order to test it. Normally you'd find these in your bathroom, garage, or basement. From a life safety aspect, GFCI receptacles are considerably safer than breaker protected circuits. To wrap this box up, I labeled the upper outlet H for hot and the lower outlet S for switched and then screwed on the cover. Moving on to the low voltage portion of this project, I needed to mount a 16 by two I2C or I squared C liquid crystal display screen in the lid of the waterproof junction box. 
This required me to drill holes in the lid to mount the LCD and then cut a hole out for the screen. This LCD will provide a readout for the current PM 2.5 levels along with the average of the last 10 PM 2.5 levels. The average will provide a bit of hysteresis to the air filter. That is, it will prevent the fan from switching on and off if the readings wander a little. I really needed to use a rotary tool, sometimes called by the name brand Dremel, to cut out a hole to mount the screen, but all my bits for it were broken. Instead, I used a combination of a hacksaw, a file, and an oscillating tool to create the hole for the LCD screen. This resulted in a rather ugly but functional hole. This is what's called an Arduino Leonardo. It's going to be the brains of the project. I'm not going to explain the code in this program, but I'll drop a link to GitHub where you can find the code I used on this. If you like this type of project, leave a comment, and I'll do more projects including microcontrollers. Actually, I'll probably just do that anyway. If you're not familiar with microcontrollers, you can think of them as mini computers that crunch code and interact with the physical world. In terms of creating prototypes, learning how to use microcontrollers, or creating one-offs, there really isn't a better platform than the Arduino platform. This is a rough schematic of how I wired the low voltage portion of this project. I'm using a PMS5003 particulate sensor from Plan Tower. The sensor's first pin is 5 volt, the second pin is ground, and the fifth is the transmit pin. Ignore the colors coming from the harness on the sensor. If yours is like mine, the 5 volt will be black, and the red will be ground, and everything is backwards, and it's awful. Pin 5 on the sensor will get wired to pin 10 on the Arduino. 5 volt and ground on the sensor will get wired to 5 volt and ground on the relay. Additionally, we're going to wire pin 0 on the Arduino to the relay. The negative low voltage pin on the relay will get wired to Arduino ground. This relay will provide isolation between the low voltage and high voltage components in this project by using an LED inside of the relay. Because of this, we don't have to worry about using any sort of pull down resistor as it's already included in the relay. Finally, we're going to wire the LCD screen up using 5 volt, ground, SCL, and SDA pins. This screen has a built-in I2C converter in it. This simplifies wiring quite a bit. The SCL and SDA pins on the LCD will get wired to the corresponding pins on the Arduino. The same goes for the 5 volt and ground. If you decide to use a different Arduino, like an UNO or ESP variant, or something else, the I2C pins will likely be different. The code uses software serial, so you can change the pin of the particulate sensor as you wish. Just make sure to account for it in the code. This is what's called a Western Union splice, or a lineman splice. It's the recommended splicing method by NASA. It also provides good mechanical properties, great electrical conduction, and is easy to use heat shrink over. If you're new to soldering, I like to set my soldering iron to maximum heat, tin the tip, apply a tiny bit of solder to the tip and the wire at the same time to get a good heat bridge, and then flow the solder along the wire. You want the solder to level out and adhere to the wire evenly. If you watch the wires closely, you can see what I mean. You also notice that on the wiring harness for this particulate sensor, the grounded 5 volts are colored incorrectly. If I'm wiring two wires to one, like I am here, branching 5 volt and ground, I like to apply two sizes of heat shrink. I'll push the smaller heat shrink as far up as it will go, shrink it, and then put the larger overlapping the smaller heat shrink. I don't really know if that's correct, it's just what I like to do. It seems to make everything turn out cleaner. To plug these wires into the Arduino, I'm going to use what's called a DuPont connector. I only have female DuPont connectors, so I'll have to make male ones. I have some links to almost everything used in this project in the description, including the male DuPont connectors, so you won't have to make your own. You don't have to use the links in the description to buy this stuff, but it'll help Ben and I make more videos if you do. The last few steps in this project included mounting the low voltage electrical box. After that was mounted, I used a Forstner bit to create a channel for the fan's power cord to go. I silicone the particulate sensor on and clean the silicone up off camera. I also originally silicone the gaps between the screen and the lid of the junction box, but then I shorted the backlight on my first LCD screen, so I had to order another one. So the second time I decided to use hot glue, because I'm not patient enough apparently to let silicone dry. 
After plugging the power cable in for the fan and the Arduino, it was time to plug it into the wall and test it out. If you're building one of these at home, plug this all into the GFCI if you have one available. Tell your spouse you're sorry there's wood dust in the bathroom or kitchen. After you confirm that it's working, feel free to take it back to the shop where it belongs. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time. Have a great Honest Brothers Day.